It's time to dungeon crawl. What's up, everyone? This is Loki Orn, and uh, today we're taking a taking a break from Darkest Dungeon Two, so that I can share a solo game that I've been having a lot of fun with. Uh, for those of you who've probably heard me talk about it before, I'm a big tabletop role playing game fan. Uh, I DM my own games. I've played in plenty of Five E games, and I I have a lot of fun with it. But one problem you always run into is. If you don't have a group to play with, it's kind of tough to play D&D by yourself. And that's what this game, 2D6 Dungeon, looks to solve. Uh, it's a little bit lighter on the role-playing aspect. After all, you are playing by yourself. But with the only requirements being some grid paper, some D6s, and maybe a virtual tabletop if you want to be fancy, you're really able to get quite a bit done with uh, not a lot of investment. I'll put a link in the description below to the Kickstarter. Uh, this was funded by either a, or not funded, um, created by a single person or a very small team. I'm not 100% sure which, but either way, they're awesome. This is a very fun game, and I just wanted to get into it. So just a couple of notes before we dive in. Uh, this is going to be sort of the live playthrough video where we're going to be talking about the dice rolls, sort of doing the mechanics, and it's going to be very, or it's going to be much more like methodical because I'm playing the game live. Uh, my intent, we'll see how this comes to fruition, is to do a re-recording or kind of a secondary recording that is more of a story focus where I put on my dungeon master cowl and sort of describe the game rather than playing it but we'll see we'll see how that develops um also this is not something that is replacing darkest dungeon 2 i have no intent or plans to do that this is purely something fun that i think is neat if you think it's neat too check it out and uh you know leave a comment or a like or you know show your support however you want to additional note um I'm playing this in Roll20, that's not a requirement, but on my second monitor I have the rule books, the and my uh, character sheet, which I will flash up on screen uh, just briefly here. Let me just check a... Uh... Oh, even better. Uh... Uh, I would like to move this screen, though. That's unfortunate. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to have to blank it out. Uh, oh, geez. Uh, no, don't auto-hide. Uh, there we go. All right. So I do have my character sheet in Word. Uh, we'll go through this just briefly. Uh, our character name is going to be Loki Orin. We're level 1. We've got 10 HP. Uh, we'll get into what shift, discipline, and a lot of these other things mean as we get into combat. Uh, this is a game system that's very simple once you've seen it and played it, but it can be a little bit weird to describe without that experience. Uh, we have two shift, one discipline. We have no favor with any of the uh, six gods. Uh, we are wielding a long sword. Um, I imagine that we are sword and board. But for right now, we just have the sword. We have our two maneuvers, incisive cut and stab. We have a quilted coat as our armor. We have some flint and steel, wax sealing kit, lantern, three rations, a scroll of heat metal, and a potion of healing. As these things come up, I will take more time to describe them. But I just wanted to, you know, take a moment to kind of show this is where we're starting. And, you know, also just kind of confirm this is where our starting point is. So let's let's get into it. Let's just start playing. So you can see here we've arrived in the dungeon. The basic lore for this game is essentially you are an adventurer. There is a dungeon. There's a town outside and you dot and you crawl into the dungeon. Anything after that is pure storytelling gravy. So let's go ahead and just start generating the room. And this is really where the strength of this system shows in that everything is randomly generated. So our first roll will be 2d6 plus 1d6. Uh, plugging it here on the right here, and we roll 3, 1, 4. Now what this translates is that the room, and I should have declared, but I, I always, I tend to just go to the right and then work my way around. Uh, we've rolled a room that is three squares wide, one square tall, with two 
exits. There are tables and charts in the core rulebook that detail all of this. I'm not going to show them because I don't know how that works from a, you know, copyright standpoint. And I think it's it's better to not show those things and let, if you're interested, you know, give them give them your money. They're they're not expensive, and this is a system that I think you'll get many hours of play with. But basically, we've generated a three by one by uh, or three by one corridor with two um, two exits. So one, two, three, and it's one high. Now there's no sense of putting an exit down here because we can't go off the grid. However, we can go over here. We'll leave our little exit, and there we go. We'll create our extension to define our room. Oh. And then here we go. Oh, come on. And there we go. So Loki Oren turns the corner and advances out of the entrance hall and into this corridor. He's got a room to his north and a room to his east. Uh, neither option leaves him in great situations if uh, he wants to avoid his cover. But knowing that most of the dungeon lies to the north, Loki Oren's going to push on past and generate another room to the to the east on the map continuing to uh continuing to go and this is where again the dun the system gets kind of funny i want to go into a room but instead i am just generating corridor after corridor one two three four and it looks like this room to our left is going to connect in uh which is kind of kind of silly in a sense um you know clearly this is a little bit of a silly design but that's the that's the beauty of a randomly generated map. Like we don't know what's going to happen until it happens. Seeing another corridor open to his north, he's just Loki Orange is going to press on to the right. We're we're going to try to finish this dungeon. And thank you, thank you, Dice Roller, for finally giving me an actual room. Uh, we have a five by three with uh, two exits. Uh, six was three exits, by the way. So we can actually go, just to create some space, we can go down three. One, two, three, four, five, all the way over. One, two, three. And that actually doesn't look very good. So we actually have the power to kind of, you know, influence this to make it look at least semi-nice. So there we go. Now, one of the rules of this game, if you would generate an exit that, you know, logically can't be there, you don't generate it. Uh, so even though this room is supposed to have two exits, it only has one because there's no way to go further to the right. That is solid stone. But this is our first room, and now we encounter the room. So we roll 2d6. We roll 1, 1, 3. And now on my second monitor, I'm looking up what room 1, 3 is. And wonderful, this is a... Uh, this is a room that's going to get to show, we're going to get to show a lot of stuff. So we're going to just, I'm just going to set this up uh, for note taking purposes. And because I think it's good practice, we rolled the guard post. A small burner provides warmth for two chairs around a low table. It is lit and casts shadows, but there's somebody here. So we roll on our encounter. Who do we, who do we meet in this battle? We roll a five on the table titled uh, Level 1 Guards. Who? What is a five on the Level 1 Guards? Okay, conveniently, it's a guard. So let's, uh, let's grab, let me grab a guard token. Uh, yeah, it seems like a pretty good guard token. Why not? And for, you know, kind of my reference, this again, all of this is sort of unnecessary, but I really like to detail out the information because I'm, especially on each individual level, we are going to be rolling these same characters, like the same enemies a fair bit. So we may as well create a token that we can copy and paste. So a guard appears. Um, one of the conceits of this game is that everybody in the dungeon is hostile. There is no role-playing your way out of a problem. You are an invader, and they want to rearrange your face. So, combat start. Alrighty, so 
Combat in 2d6, much like room generation, is resolved rolling 2d6s. We don't roll for initiative. Instead, the um, the player always goes first unless specifically specified. So, behold, combat. We roll 2d6. And we roll a 6 by 2. Now, I mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about shift. And this is where shift comes in. So, if I bring up my character sheet again... Uh, you'll see here that we have two maneuvers with our longsword. These are our attacks. These are the only attacks we can do. We can incisive cut, which requires that we roll a five, a five as our primary die and a two as our secondary die, or we can stab, which is a two by four for this amount of damage. Now, in this case, we rolled a six by two, so we were very close to an incisive cut, but just one off. And that's where the stat shift comes into play. As a hero, we are trained professionals at this. So as you see the blow about to miss, you adjust your hand at the last moment, changing your wrist or your grip to bring the, bl the blow home. In this case, incisive cut is requires us to only shift one die, the six down to a five. So we hit and deal one D6 plus one damage. And now we check the guard because your, your enemies and also us can mitigate damage using armor and other abilities. So the guard has an interrupt skill that can mitigate damage. However, it doesn't have anything that stops a 5x2 attack. So we hit him for 7 damage. Wow. So imagine, if you will, the you know Loki Orin enters this room, sees the guard post, and as the guy is even rising up, drawing his sword to defend himself, we're on him immediately. And with a single cut... He dies. However, since, and this is this is one of the optional rules in the game, because we killed him with exact damage, that is, he, he went to exactly zero HP, we are going to trigger the near-death table. Uh, this table uh, is applied under, a cer under certain conditions, um, and I have the kind of homebrew rule that it only applies once per floor. You're not going to stack this up. But we're going to roll and see the number. It rolls a four. Okay. Uh, so as this guard lays dying, he seems repentant in this moment. Uh, realizing that his life is at an end, he chokes out the phrase, mind the trap. Okay. So we have unlocked a quest. Which is, and we will make some notes here, level one near death quest. The roll was a four. And we will say, mind the trap. Um, encounter a trap that uses stone. Um, can avoid with no consequences. So that's a pretty good one. That means if we encounter a trap in the dungeon that uses stone as its kind of means of hitting you, uh, we can just no sell it. We can just say, uh, no. Our, the, our guard, the guard we just murdered, told us with his dying breath to watch out for that. Well, we've slain the guard, and now we get to check over his pockets and the loot. For the guard, we get to roll on a loot table. Oh, no thank you. Stop it. Jeez. We get to roll on a loot table, which in this case we roll 2d6 plus 1, or minus 1, and check the table. And in general, the, we've now shown the two kinds of rolls that we are doing. It's either roll 2d6 and look at the two numbers in sequence, so, you know, our 5 by 2, or roll the two and add them together. In this case, we roll the loot, uh, we check the guard's pockets, and we find a pouch with d6 silver coins in it. We'll roll that d6. Five silver coins. So in addition to everything else, we're taking this guy's life savings. Uh, but interestingly, we also get to add the pouch that the coins came in. So we're just going to add a... We're going to add a pouch to our inventory, put five silver coins in it, and call that a win. 
It's also nice because that means we now have a money pouch, so we don't have to think about our coins rattling around in the in the rest of our uh, pack. Now let me go back to the room because the guard post has a follow-up. If you survive the combat encounter, we roll on the interruptions and unexpected complications table, which is a measure the two measure the two dice. Come on, roll 20, you can do it. We roll f five by six, okay. We go to our table, five by six. Uh, let's see, a box on the wall opens out to show an ornate carved bone shrine. Roll, roll to identify the god. There's a small ledge where you can place offerings. When correctly applied, gain a, faith, a favor point. So we will roll to see what god it is. We roll a three, which we go to the god table. And we get to find out which god this is. In this case, it is Maduva the Rot. That's pretty hardcore. So we will just put a little note here. Uh, shrine, Maduva. So we can note here that there is a shrine to Maduva here. However, we have not sacrificed to it. So I like to just put a little... Uh, I just like to put a little note to myself, uh, just do it in black, uh, not used, not used. And there we go, that's the, that is, that is actually kind of the, the basic system of this game. Now granted, we had it pretty easy there, it's not every day that you just absolutely dunk on a guard, and let me just bounce a bunch of this stuff to the map layer, so it fits better. But that is, uh, that is how we do. Uh, before I forget the final thing we need to do, uh, we get experience points. A guard is worth 13 experience points. So as I uh, bring my uh, character sheet back on, Loki Orin now has 13 XP. And we've added the money pouch with the five silver coins to it. Very nice. We'll hit save. And we'll keep going. So combat one. Oh, almost forgot. Uh, the door. Um, so right so far, the corridors and rooms we've gone through have had what are called archway entrances and exits. Basically, they're just paths through. No resistance, no lock, no anything. The guard post, though, has reinforced doors. So we will. we need to make a uh, marker for that, which generally I just do a... Um, Oh, wait, probably help if I did the right thing here. I just do a square box with a line through it to signify that this is a reinforced door. And we need to check if this door is locked. So we roll a d6. Low is definitely better than high. I'll confirm on my uh, second monitor here. Low is better than high. The door is not locked. So even though it is a reinforced door, it is not locked, and we can pass through it. So let's continue. We're just going to kind of continue. Loki Oren, seeing that he's got kind of a, a good angle here, he's securing the presence here, he can just keep going up. So now we have a room that is a 2 by 4 So one of the smallest rooms in the dungeon, but still a full-sized room. It's only two wide, four tall, and has a single exit. So it looks like we're going to keep going straight up. But I'm going to take the opportunity, because I have this power, one, two, three, four, to kind of arc over a bit to the right and leave more space over here to try to allow more of the dungeon to fill in. But just as before, we generated the room. Now we encounter the room. Uh, we do a... So before we did a 1 by 3 now we do a 3 by 1 uh, It's important to note that some items are, uh, or some rooms are unique, as in they can only appear once on a floor. Others, like the guard posts, for example, are, you know, you can appear as many times as you like. So the, we have uncovered the snake pit. A dusty bowl set into the floor is home to an angry-looking snake. It rises up towards you. Alrighty, so we've got a sne oh hecko, it's a sneko. Let's get a snake out. Uh, we'll use we'll use our we'll use my giant snake token from D and D. Snake. 
And as before, you know, basically we enter a room and immediately, you know, it's it's combat. It's uh, this is very much a dungeon a dungeon grinder. We're not here to. Uh... Oh, my bad. We don't know that it's it, we have to roll on the uh, table. Uh, you must face a snake roll on L1S. Okay, so I got to roll on the proper uh, level one snakes. So we roll on our snakes table. We roll a five. A giant horned anaconda. All right. Well, that's that looks like more of a cobra. So let's see if we can get a constrictor. Do we have? Do I have a constrictor? Constrictor. I don't have any. Uh, okay, I don't have any assets for this. Um, I've got to have a better snake for this. I have so many, I have so many options. Uh, snake, I kind of would prefer to use a full token rather than a, um, geez, all this stuff. Uh, python? Maybe, like, maybe I called it a python. Uh, geez, um. All right, I guess we're I guess we're using a generic uh, generic snake token here. Not my favorite thing to do, but it's better than the alternative. So, hello snake. So this is a this is a uh, where did where did it go? Giant horned anaconda. Giant horned anaconda. Uh oh. Uh oh. 15 HP. We are we are in a bit of trouble here. Well, let's uh let's get into it. So, combat start. Now, it's important to note as we dive into combat that there are other actions that will become available later, but unfortunately for right now, there's uh nothing else we can really do. Uh, so it's combat start. We have no action, like pre-game actions to take. So we're just going to go straight in to rolling. So we roll a four by five. Now, if you remember, our magic numbers are five by two and two by four. And we can shift the dice up to two times. There's no way to make, make that work. So we miss. The snake takes its turn. Rolling a five by one. Now, we're very fortunate that the snake only has shift one because its really gnarly attack is five by three. So it just misses smothering us. So that is the end of round one. Round two. We strike again, the two of us exchanging blows. Five by six. Ah, oh, man. So many good things could have happened there. Uh, but instead, we get we miss again. And the snake gets to reply. One by three. Okay, the snake does manage to hit us with its horn jab attack, which does 2d6 minus, one, minus two. And unfortunately, we have no way to mitigate this. So we're just going to take it. Fortunately, it glances off of our armor. So the snake jabs us in the chest with its head, and it just sort of bounces off. We take no damage. Round three. Uh, so we're starting we're starting to feel a little concerned here. This is a gnarly animal, but we can't we can't run from it. Whew, one by two. Uh, can we can we make anything out of that? No, we still can't. So that's a miss again, and the snake goes again. Three by six. Once again, the snake misses as well. We are fear that. Now round four. So you'll see, you'll note that I'm typing in shift plus one. Uh, so. Shift is not only your kind of talent as a fighter and your ability to change the blow and guarantee the hit. It also represents fatigue. So we've been fighting. We've exchanged three rounds of blows with this thing. And we're both, we and the snake are starting to get tired. So the shift scores start going up. I am now at shift plus three. The snake is at shift plus two. What this means is that eventually combat becomes sort of inevitable. Both sides are going to start hitting a lot, and we're going to find out who can kill who. Uh, so we're round four. Shift is plus one, so we are at shift three. And we roll six by four. 
Uh, shift three lets us turn that into five by two. So we managed to hit uh, for our D6 plus one attack. Unfortunately, the snake blocks on secondary twos for minus two damage. So we do nothing. Ow. The snake, in turn, applies six by four, and with its shift two, it lands its smother attack. So, first of all, it deals damage. We have no way to mitigate this. We take three points of damage. Oh, oops. No, I don't, I'm not down to three. I'm at seven. And it activates its special attack. I miss the next round. So, it wraps itself around me and starts squeezing. And it can continue to smother me, but it can't make me skip my turn again. Round five. Shift is now at plus two. We're getting more tired. I, I auto miss. The snake attacks again. Two by two. It can horn jab me with that. So it'll horn jab me. Basically for free and gets me for another two. Oof, we are in we are in trouble. Round six. Shift plus three. This is the maximum shift. So we are now at shift five. It is pretty hard for us to miss. Whoo, that's big. Okay, this is big. So this is a critical attack, or as um, as the game calls it, a prime attack roll. We've rolled double sixes, which means we get to pick a skill and automatically hit with it, and we get to add our shift to the damage. So even though stab, um, even though stab is not as easily mitigated, by the anaconda it still works out that it's 2d it's 1d6 plus 1 minus 2 plus 5 wow mineral hit it for 5 that was that was brutal all right it is the snake's turn the snake rolls and rolls double fours it can easily get its smother or its horn jab with that it doesn't really matter because it's the same damage either way and it hits us for another two now, we, we have a decision to make here. We are losing this fight. Um, unless we get some very lucky prime attacks. And we are in the range where it can pretty easily kill us. So we, in round seven. Round seven. Drink potion. We drink our potion of healing, which bops us back up to 10 HP. And the snake rolls its attack. One by five. It can still make its horn jab. Yep, we are in world of hurt. Two damage. All right. So that's two turns we've had to miss here as this slugging match continues. Six by two becomes five by two. We get it for another five. Okay, we're getting in range where we can kill this thing. It, it replies. Three by four. It easily makes horn jab. And rolls zero. Oh, that is big. That is big. That might give us the chance to finish this off. Round nine, we swing again. Uh, we can make two by four with that. We can we make five by two, three and one? Yeah, we can make we can make uh, we can make incisive cut with that. One damage. Okay, we're still in this. It replies one by five. Down two, up one. Yep, it still makes horn. It makes horn jab. One damage. Okay, we're still okay. Remember, there, or I should say, there is no option to run here. We are in a fight to the death with this snake. And we are getting absolutely chewed up here. One by four, can that become five by two? No, but it can become two by four, which is 1d6 minus, let's make sure it's 1d6 minus one. Yeah. We can make it into two by four for our stab attack. We do another two damage. All right, the snake is on its last legs. It's going to reply. Two by four becomes horn jab. Another three damage. Okay, we are uh, we are both in range where we can kill each other. It's going to come down to who lands that blow. Round 11. Three by five. So we can, we can definitely make stabs. That's... Boom. Snake down Whew. 
that was brutal. The, the giant horned anaconda is one of the toughest, toughest enemies we could be facing this early. That was an absolutely brutal affair. We're at four HP and no healing potions. This is this is not uh, good. Let me go on to my sheet and mark off my healing potion. So that'll do it for part one. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Remember to like, comment, subscribe. You know the drill. Let the YouTube algorithm know this is content that you and people like you like to watch. That was a heck of a fight against that snake, and there's a lot more to come. Part two should already be out. I've just broken up this recording so that uh, the video file sizes don't get completely unmanageable. Thanks for watching. See ya.